Hello, my name's Julie Old and today I'm going to be talking about WOMSAT. So to start off with, what are wombats? Well, there's three species of wombats. However, all three species are large, weighing about 30 to 40 kilograms. They live in burrows and they're herbivores. Bare-nosed wombats are also called common wombats and they are distributed along the southeastern coastline and alpine areas, mountainous regions of New South Wales, in areas of Victoria, a small southeast portion of South Australia, as well as throughout Tasmania and some of the islands in the Bass Strait. The southern hairy-nosed wombat is distributed in the southern portion of South Australia and into the southeast corner of Western Australia. They are currently listed as vulnerable. The third species of wombat is the northern hairy-nosed wombat and it is found in two locations in Queensland. There is approximately 250 individuals left and these are protected within feral proof fenced areas. The second population is not a natural population, it's a translocated population. So one of the issues that we study as researchers is investigating the problem with sarcoptic mange. Sarcoptic mange, it is a disease found in wombats as well as over a hundred different mammalian species worldwide. It's an emerging infectious disease and it is caused by an animal called Sarcoptes scabii and it's a type of mite. Mites are related to ticks. So this mite impacts two species in particular. This is the bare-nosed wombat and the southern hairy-nosed wombat. Luckily, it's not in the northern hairy-nosed wombat population. The mites burrow into the skin and you can see in the photos there where the wombats are heavily impacted by this mite burrowing into their skin. It also results in hair loss in the wombats and you can see that they get thick scabs across their body and around their eyes, making it difficult for them to see and also around their ears, making it potentially difficult for them to hear as well. So we've c conducted some ecological studies using spotlighting at night and we've designated wombats with a mange score. One being doesn't look like it's impacted, two with some level of sarcoptic mange infection and three with a heavy mange infestation. In those investigations using spotlighting we found that around 20% of wombats in our study populations are affected but different factors appear to influence that number. We've been investigating the effect of these treatment stations on wombats. Are they effective? Are they not? Some of the things that we've found is that they can be ineffective in areas with very high wombat numbers. And there's many reasons for this. Largely it's to do with the behavior of wombats. So wombats don't just have one burrow. One individual wombat can have 10 or more burrows that it might use throughout its home range. And those 10 burrows can also be utilized by other wombats that have home ranges that cross over other wombats' home ranges. So they share the burrows, but not necessarily at the same time. Hence, in an area where there are large numbers of wombats, it's very difficult to target one specific wombat because it could be using 10 or more different burrows. And so you would need a treatment station at each of those burrows. And you may miss the wombat that you need to treat, or you may be treating wombats that don't need to be treated. So there's a lot of trouble targeting specific wombats. It might also be that um, carers and researchers are unable to access some of those burrows and they might be in dense scrubland or other areas that's difficult for people to access. Hence, it's difficult to put on a treatment station on all the burrows. As well as that, the flaps need to be checked daily, been treated or not. It's also really important that effective treatment plans are strictly followed. It's not ideal to treat wombats on an ad hoc basis. You need a really strict plan and it needs to be followed. 
Long term, the use of antiparasitic treatments might lead to mite resistance as well. So again, it's really important that if a wombat is being treated, that it's being treated effectively in a planned way. So with these limitations in mind, it's really important to recognize that there is no short term solution. So Chandini and I conducted a literature review on sarcoptic mange in wombats, and we published that in 2017. So why are wombats so badly affected by sarcoptic mange? And are there factors that influence prevalence? Is there something about the wombat immune system that's different to other animals? And why is it that the wombat's so badly affected? Is it to do with stress? Are they lacking some sort of nutrition? Also, we wanted to know where the wombats with and without sarcoptic mange were located and were their numbers significant? So we know from our ecological studies that it's about 20%, but it'll vary greatly depending on time of year, location, and the numbers of wombats in the area. But throughout Australia, is that the case as well? We also wanted to know what the other threats to wombats might be. And one of the first things we wanted to look at was the level of diversity of MHC genes in the wombat population. MHC stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. It's a group of genes that can be correlated to the level of immunological fitness of an individual or group of individuals. So just like we have a set of keys that need to open a lock, the more keys we have, the greater the chance of us finding the correct key that will unlock that lock. And just like genes, the more genes we have, the more keys we have, the better chance we have of fighting that disease. An honor student called Eden conducted an investigation into the MHC genes. So we wanted to do our research non-invasively. In other words, we didn't want to go out and catch the wombat. And the good thing about wombats is that they have large scats that are quite cube shaped in appearance. They also tend to deposit them in positions high up off the ground. Eden collected these scat samples and used some molecular techniques to extract the DNA and amplify the MHC genes. So of the 90 DNA samples that Eden obtained from bare-nosed wombats, we found 42 unique MHC class II DAB nucleotide sequences. These nucleotide sequences, or DNA sequences, were 172 base pairs in length, and we determined that these MHC genes were very similar to other marsupials, as we'd expect. We found some very fundamental information about those immunological genes from wombats for the first time. And one thing that we want to do is widen the scope of immunological genes that we can investigate. Some other work that we conducted was investigating ticks, because ticks are more closely related to mites than many other species. She identified the ticks that were found on the wombats using morphological techniques, and also then she extracted DNA from the ticks and investigated what pathogens they might potentially be carrying. Danielle found there were quite a few species of tick that impacted wombats, that there were also some diseases carried in those ticks included the disease Q fever. Something else we've been investigating is the nutrition in wombats. I've worked with my collaborator, Haley, and we have investigated both in captivity, in the wild, the diet of wombats. Blair conducted a master's project looking at nutrition in bare-nosed wombats. And Fiona, more recently, has been working on nutrition in northern hairy-nosed wombats. We've also conducted some other research that I worked on with Michael using a drone to see if we could map out bare-nosed wombat burrows and if we could use a drone to determine which burrows were active and which burrows were not. Some other research that we conducted investigated wombat burrows and this study investigated what other animals were utilising wombat burrows. And are those animals potentially infected with mange as well? 
A further paper that we investigated was looking at analysing the data that we had collected from our spotlighting surveys at multiple locations over multiple years and investigating whether we could see any patterns in that data. Were there specific times of year, i.e. season, where sarcoptic mange was more prevalent in the population? And we found that there appears to be an increase in the prevalence of sarcoptic mange after rain. We've also conducted some thorough desktop research projects investigating other aspects of sarcoptic mange in wombats. One study that we recently conducted was supported by Candice and we surveyed wildlife carers on how they were treating sarcoptic mange infected wombats in the wild. Specifically how they used cydectin. So we found that there were lots of different volumes and concentrations of cydectin being used, different time periods in between treating individual wombats and different methods of treating them. And there were lots of reasons for this. Another desktop review that we recently conducted involved a systematic review of moxidectin as a treatment for parasitic infections in mammalian species. And in particular, we wanted to look at what were the smallest doses that were affected and the highest doses that were effective and didn't cause any harm to the animals. Of course, one of the other issues we still wanted to know what the other threats to wombats were and Rowan conducted a literature review looking at the distribution and abundance and threats of bare-nosed wombats and that was published recently as well. If we get back to that question about where are the wombats with and without sarcoptic mange located and are their numbers significant, it's really difficult for us to tell in just our study sites and be able to extrapolate that so we aimed to utilise citizen science. Citizen science is a really important tool and allows researchers to gather data across large areas or areas that is just not possible for us to do otherwise. And this led to the citizen science project called WOMSAT, Wombat Survey and Analysis Tool. This is a project where citizens can help to collect data so that we can look at where sarcoptic mange occurs over a much broader distribution than we can otherwise survey ourselves. And Candice was pivotal in this work. So prior to us starting WOMSAT, the last survey of sarcoptic mange in wombats was conducted in 1998. This was a great study. Sarcoptic mange was widespread in the population. However, it only gives us one little snapshot in time. It doesn't give us any information about what might be impacting the prevalence of sarcoptic mange in those areas. So the advantage of using citizen science is that it can give us that information over time. It can record and monitor the occurrence and distribution in real time. We also wanted to raise the profile of wombats by increasing public knowledge about wombats and the impact that sarcoptic mange was having on it. So through this citizen science project, we could collect information in real time, increase knowledge across the wider community, and we could also record other threats to wombats. And we wanted to use that data in the longer term to help develop a management plan. So this is the website here. As well as a website, WOMSAT is available as an app, as an Android and iPhone download. Obviously, it's available to the public for free because it's a citizen science project. It's utilised to report wombat sightings. However, we can also enter information about wombat activity, such as burrows or scats. And we can also report if the wombat is dead or alive. Citizens can report the level of sarcoptic mange in the animal. It's also beneficial to be able to upload a photograph of the sighting to provide evidence. And obviously, 
We can put information about the time of day the animal was observed or the date that was observed and where it's observed. Currently, there are 21,865 sightings of wombats in Wombsat and counting. We also engage the public by the use of Facebook and Twitter and more recently Instagram. And we tend to use the hashtag Wombat Wednesday, which we developed in 2015 to raise the profile of wombats. And that hashtag is used quite widely throughout the wombat community now as well. You can see some of the photos that have been uploaded to Wombsat. So the other advantage of using Wombsat is that we can also investigate other threats to wombats. Unfortunately, many Australians do see wombats on the side of the road that have been hit by cars. Sightings can be uploaded to Wombsat and the information obtained can be utilized and collected to inform road managers about where wombat road kills are occurring. And, and this roadkill data, like psychoptic mange data, can be collected in real time. So we can determine when wombats are more likely to be killed on roads. Once identified, these roadkill hotspots can then be targeted by road managers as areas where they can implement mitigation strategies, therefore reducing roadkill on wombats. Some of the data is currently being investigated by Sujitha and preliminary results have suggested that a higher number of wombat road kills occur in late winter and early spring. So we're continuing that work, but we also know that the majority of wombats that are killed are healthy. That is, they don't have psychoptic mange. So some of the data is also being analysed by Sujitha in terms of sarcoptic mange. And these are some very early maps from very preliminary work. And you can see there are some definite hotspots in terms of where sarcoptic mange in wombats occurs. You'll also notice though that those are centred around large human population areas. And so we're working to reduce those biases in our analysis. So what can you do to help? Well, obviously you can become a wombat warrior. You can help us learn more about wombats and psychoptic mange and other threats to wombats. And you can help us to increase the profile of wombats through the hashtag Wombat Wednesday. You can download the app for the Android or iPhone and check out the website wombsat.org.au. And obviously get out there and start mapping your wombat sightings and wombat burrows. I'd really like to acknowledge all the people that have helped us with our research to date. There's been so many people that have allowed us to survey their properties. We've had volunteers, wildlife carers, citizen scientists, wombat warriors, all the researchers and students. I'd also like to give a shout out to Peter West from New South Wales DPI that helped support the Wombsat website. I'd also in particular like to thank Emirates Airlines and Walgan Valley one and only for their support in funding some of our research as well as the establishment of the WOMSAT website. Um, I'd also like to thank New South Wales Wires and Victorian Wildlife and Mike Swinbourne in particular for providing a large number of sightings to the database and the Wombat Protection Society. If you have any questions you can connect with us at wombsat.org.au. You can email us at wombsat at outlook.com. And remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. And post your sighting of a wombat at the hashtag Wombat Wednesday.